Hello, my name is Dr Luke Howard and I'm a consultant respiratory physician at Hammersmith Hospital, which is part of the National Pulmonary Hypertension Service. I'd like to talk to you about the right ventricle in pulmonary hypertension. The first aspect to consider is the physiology. We need to recall that the entire cardiac output passes through the pulmonary circulation and therefore it is a low resistance system, unlike in the left side where the left ventricle faces a high afterload due to a higher resistance. As a result, the right ventricle is thin-walled compared with the left ventricle, which is thick-walled. In health, as described, the pulmonary circulation is a low-pressure system, and the pulmonary vascular resistance is about an eighth of the systemic circulation. What this means is that the stroke work that the right ventricle undertakes during systole is much lower than the left ventricle, and as a result, the right ventricle has much less contractility than the left ventricle. The right ventricle itself is far more compliant than the left ventricle and adapts much better to volume loading than pressure loading. This is because of its thin walls. The left and the right ventricles, however, do not function independently and the mechanics of one can affect the other. And this is mediated by the interventricular septum, which is not simply a passive dividing wall between the two, but has contractility in itself. In disease, and specifically pulmonary hypertension, the volume-loaded right ventricle, such as we might see in a left-to-right shunt or in severe tricuspid regurgitation, the septum flattens, and it flattens in diastole because there are higher pressures in the right ventricle during this phase of the cardiac cycle. When the right ventricle is pressure-loaded, the septum will characteristically flatten during systole, i.e. during contraction. When we have an acute situation, such as a pulmonary embolus, the right ventricle will dilate and its free wall will become hypokinetic. But in a chronic situation, where afterload has increased gradually over time, this will lead to a remodeling process of the right ventricle, typically hypertrophy and fibrosis. Here on the left you see a normal heart, and on the right you see a hypertrophied right heart. This is in response to chronic right ventricular afterload. The hypertrophy can be benign, such that it increases contractility and overall function of the right ventricle in the face of high pressures. But in addition, we see maladaptive processes consisting of apoptosis, inflammation, fibrosis, ultimately contractile dysfunction, and myocyte necrosis. And it is these processes which ultimately lead to right ventricular failure. Now I'm going to take you through the physiological changes in response to elevated right ventricular afterload. As described, we see right ventricular hypertrophy develop, which leads to increased contractility to deal with this increased afterload. The right ventricle will also dilate in response to increased afterload, and this dilatation will further increase contractility through frank starling mechanisms. The right ventricular dilatation, however, leads to functional tricuspid regurgitation, which in itself leads to further dilatation of the right ventricle. Because blood is now going backwards, this leads to a decrease in stroke volume and consequently a decrease in left ventricular filling. With maladaptive right ventricular remodeling and an inability to match the ever-increasing right ventricular afterload, we see an impaired contractile function of the right ventricle, and this further leads to decrease in stroke volume and decrease in left ventricular filling. Further decrease in the contractile function of the right ventricle leads to further right ventricular dilatation and the vicious cycle continues. Second, we need to consider the anatomy of the right and left ventricles. Here is a normal heart, and on the left you see a four-chamber view. The right ventricle is triangular in shape and the left ventricle is conical in shape. On the right you see a cross-sectional view or a short axis. The right ventricle looks like a crescent, whereas the left ventricle is circular. In health, on the left, we see that the septal geometry in motion is influenced by the higher pressures in the left ventricle. This means that the left ventricle is circular in cross-section and the septum bows in to the right ventricle. In pulmonary hypertension, on the right, we see that pressure loading of the right ventricle caused by increase in pulmonary artery pressure flattens the septum in systole as the pressures in the right side and the left side come closer together. In severe pulmonary hypertension, the septum may even bulge into the left ventricular cavity. 
The movement of the septum is influenced not only by the pressure difference between the two sides, but also by the fact that right ventricular systole lasts longer than left ventricular systole in pulmonary hypertension, and this further contributes to the abnormal septal motion and also a bounce of the septum at the end of systole into the left ventricle. So there are both physiological and anatomical considerations when assessing the right ventricle. There are many parameters that we can measure which reflect right ventricular function, and these come from echocardiography, magnetic resonance, right heart catheterization, and biomarkers. And in this protocol, we will take you through the measurements made at echocardiography assessment. So to conclude, it's important to consider and understand both the anatomy and the physiology of the right ventricle, and how this changes in response to pulmonary hypertension. And this helps us to understand better the uses of echocardiography in pulmonary hypertension assessment. Echocardiography can be used to assess the severity of right ventricular dysfunction, and it provides an excellent way of assessing pulmonary hypertension and its progression in a non-invasive way. Thank you for listening.